Uh, my name is Brad Nackey, and I am the Enterprise Account Leader for United Technologies Building Solutions Group. Today I'm going to talk to you about the top operational and energy saving trends for data center and data center cooling. Basically, we're going to cover four topic areas here. Expand the knowledge of data center cooling systems, broaden understanding for utilizing data center waste heat, gaining insight into the latest advances in modular data center cooling opportunities, and gain insight into the energy expense savings using modular data center cooling opportunities. Right now within data centers, a lot of work has been done on the IT side of the data center. Uh, the IT folks have taken a lot of, uh, been able to reduce the size of the footprint, make boxes more energy efficient, make the switch mode power supplies gone from a 0.7 power factor to a 0.94, 0.96 power factor. UPSs have gotten much more energy efficient, again, from a 0.7 to a 0.8, 0.96 and even some touting Unity if you go to um, line interactive units. Crack units have gotten much more energy efficient on the floor. There's a lot of technology that can be done. But the last area that really hasn't been touched within data center is the chiller plants. Uh, a lot of reasons for this. Some of it's been the age of the equipment. Some of it's been the, that it's outside the plant a lot of times, so it's thought of last. Sometimes it's just big iron, so people haven't thought about it. So there's technologies that are out there now that take advantage of these chiller plants and how to modernize and bring those together. Let's start with assessments, modernization, and then also services. And I'll talk about a few of those here. Some of the technology advances uh, in chiller performance. Uh, there's some new technologies that are out there. Uh, one of those technologies is a variable speed screw. Variable speed screw technology will go from 500 tons of cooling up to 1,200 tons of cooling, whether it's on a water-cooled or an air-cooled type of platform. Uh, the advantage to some of these systems is uh, you reduce the surge. You don't have surge as an issue within the units. Uh, in addition, they're much more energy efficient by how they work. Um, an independent study was done on variable speed screws versus mag, and the variable speed screws were 11% more energy efficient. Um, they also had a better total cost of ownership, lower maintenance cost. They had a higher flexibility in their operating range from 55 degree entering condenser water up to 105 entering condenser water. Um, and this is a third party study that was done by GSA, and if someone's interested, um, we can provide you that information. Um, in addition, there's also rapid start within the data centers. And rapid start technology, uh, there's two schools of thought. One is how quick can I get my chiller plant up and working? Um, we subscribe to uh, more how do I get full capacity recovery? And I equate it to like a gen set. Gen sets, people say I can get a gen set up in 12 seconds but I can't drop full load on a gen set. I have to walk in the load. It's the same thing with a chiller. I can start a chiller, I can back up the controls with a UPS, but unless that chiller can take full load in order to support a data center, it's not effective. And then smart service. A lot of discussions going on out in the industry right now as it relates to smart service. And what that is is kind of an uh, internet of things. Taking the, the IO from a chiller, bringing that in, doing predictive diagnostics, data analytics, and taking a look at how that chiller is working from day one through time and trending it. It's taking a look at variable, variables and parameters on that chiller. Uh, for example, we had a university that was running uh, their chiller, but they were in hot, ga bas hot gas bypass for 85% of the time, and they were in surge mode for 85% of the time. By adjusting some of the control parameters, took them down to 10 to 15% hot gas bypass, and also surge, saved them 30% energy just on that chiller alone. In addition to looking at just a chiller, 
There's also looking at the chilled water system as an entire system. By being able to do that, you can get an additional gain of 3 to 15 percent energy efficiency. So you can put in energy efficient chillers, but if they don't work together with the cooling tower, or they don't work together with the pump packages, they don't work together with the load that's being called for, um, you're not being as energy efficient as you can. By having the system work all together, um, gets you these, these energy savings and gains. Um, I equate it to um, like crack units within a data center to where now they have the capability of doing zone controls. And you don't have one in reheat, one in cool combating each other. They now work together. Chiller plant health management is where you take a look then at that whole plant and how does that whole plant work together. And when you, you look at the predictive diagnostics and fault detection and diagnostics within that chiller plant, you can make predictive analysis as to how the whole system is going to perform. And you can make corrections before um, failure occurs. Um, you can tell when a motor is about to go or a VFD is about to go because your amperage is going up higher. You're much less efficient. You've known over time you've been using 50 amps. Now you're using 75 amps. And I know that's not an accurate statement, but it's just for illustrative purposes. But you're able to see the difference over time. By being able to trend this, track this, you're able to know the performance of what an individual chiller is, what your cooling towers are, what your whole plant is being able to do. So you're able to control that, make modifications, make maintenance corrections which is novel ahead of time on the clock instead of an emergency break fix type of environment. You also save additional funds. In addition to regular chillers, a lot of modular chillers are now being looked at for data centers. A lot of data centers, if they're conscripted to be 200,000 square foot, they're building out in 20,000 or 50,000 square foot increments. As you do that, you can pre-build the chiller plants. You can put them up on skids with the pump packages, with the controls. You can have it all ready to go so you have uniform chillers throughout the facility. Um, on that 50,000 square foot, that's then able to grow in series to be able to handle the 200,000 square foot, and you can still do an N or an N plus one type of configuration. This type of model allows you to also be flexible in how you do your financing. You can do it as a capex, a purchase is always nice, but you can also do it as a lease, lease to own, rental, and you can also do novel systems which are uh, more of a utility model to where you can do it as cooling as a service. So you can do the whole chiller plant as an operational opex expense for the, for the data center, and that changes your billing models back to customers as well gives a lot more flexibility to the capital as it's being used. Within the data center industry right now, there's been a lot of acquisition. Within that acquisition, there's a lot of systems that people don't know what they've had. They've inherited legacy systems. They've also becoming landlocked within data centers. So instead of urban sprawl, they now have um, big city growth where they're going up instead of out. As such, that's requiring retrofits and upgrades and capability to be able to handle that. Um, there's systems that are out there that can go in series up to 500 tons of cooling, but they'll fit in an elevator. So you can take them from point A to point B and be able to deliver the cooling where you need it. Um, there's container ready systems that are out there and available for cooling. It's a module that fits within uh, an IDF container, for example, whether it's a 20 foot, 40 foot container. Um, some people also use containers and, and they put a sidecar next to it. And there's also systems where they're knocked down. Build up an air handler, um, test the air handler, do the commissioning on it, then you break it down, take it to the customer site, and you can build it back up on site, but you can get it through the elevators, you can get it through the doorways without having to get a crane, bring it in from the side. Um, a lot of high rises are also constricted as far as roof space, you can't add anymore, so you need to be able to do it within the space or on the floor. 
a 100-story um, building. You can't even get a crane up that high. you got to do it by a helicopter. So being able to knock it down, take it up, becomes much more cost effective. In addition to the, the cooling systems, uh, there's also fire systems, security systems, and making sure that these systems all work within the environment are important. Some of the trends that are happening right now are, as I mentioned, um, there's been a lot of acquisition, there's been a lot of starting with, I think I'm gonna be at 100,000 square foot, business has been good, I'm gonna add another 100,000 square foot. The question then comes, how do I capitalize on my existing fire system? Someone may have put in a fire system or a security system, general contractor put it in to save cost, it was limited on IO, put in 50,000 points. The new 50,000 square foot data center you're going to add to that as an expansion is going to require another 50,000 points. If the system's not able to handle it at 100,000, how do you be able to do that? N new systems that are out there now can work as a master-slave type of environment. They can also work with um, disparate or differential equipment, uh, meaning third-party equipment will work with other third-party equipment. Um, and they'll all communicate, whether it's through BACnet or LOMWORKS. In addition, there's different types of uh, fire protection systems that are out there now. Uh, within the data center, um, you have pre-action water, you have, um, um, try not to use brand names here, um, you have clean agent systems. Uh, there's also now a, a water mist type of system that's FM certified for data centers um, that'll allow you to do, be much more cost effective um, for certain applications. One of those applications would be edge computing. Uh, with edge computing, a lot of people are retrofitting storefronts and storefronts aren't weight lifted for the additional um, requirements that are needed in a data center as far as wiring, piping, et cetera. Um, by going with a water mist system, you use uh, much, you're using stainless pipes, you're using much less gauge, much less weight, um, and the ceiling structures can be able to handle it in a retrofit type of environment. I tried to identify a couple of success stories of some of the things that have been done. Um, in a hyperscale environment, uh, we had a customer who was looking for to be able to, um, they wanted an average PUE of 1.4 um, by going with a water side economizers in an air handling and then also using that water side economization in the chillers. We were able to take that uh, PUE down to 1.089. So there's things that can be done within the technology. Um, some of it is going to be dependent based on environment whether it's going to be a cold environment versus a hot environment, but there's things that can be done within the technology. Um, DX chillers, DX um, air handling systems can now start to match uh, water-cooled systems as far as energy and performance when you take a total cost of ownership look at it. Another system that was developed was for high-density computing. And I brought this as an example where we did the whole thing as a system, where the, the chillers worked in concert with the air handling systems, worked in the delivery systems out on the floor. This particular one was CO2 based. And the reason was is that it was done over in Paris, over in Europe in the EU. Um, they don't like to use uh, hydrocarbons, so they had to come up with a different refrigerant in order to be used in order to meet their green energy and efficiency needs. So CO2 is used. As I mentioned with the air handlers, there's different technologies, different strategies, depending on the locale and the environment. You can use direct evaporative, you can use indirect evaporative, or you can use two-stage indirect evaporative. There's, there's different strategies. People like to use different types of processes. Um, depending on their environment, but a lot of it's legacy and what they're used to using. Some of the new technologies now allow much better um, effects, as I mentioned, to where you can use DX now 
in order to hit the same type of efficiencies before you had to require water in order to get to it. On the, the larger type of systems, when you're, you know you're building out in 50,000 square foot increments, you can go, instead of using uh, cracks down on the floor, we have individual um, points of failure, you can go with large modular systems in order to be able to much more energy efficient and to, and to deliver um, the cooling where you want it as you need it. You can also take advantage then of free cooling. And a lot of this is being done within the data center environment. Um, challenge with data centers is even though you take advantage of free cooling, even if you get 85, 90% based off of your environment, you still have that 10% where you need to have a DX system involved because there's gonna be those times when you have to maintain cooling within that environment, you can't shut the data center down, so you have to have a backup plan. Another way to save energy within a data center is district heating. Generally with district heating requires three things. Requires a municipality that wants to participate, requires a utility that wants to participate, and it requires a data center that has waste heat that you want to get rid of. Um, there's particularly in the Nordic areas, uh, some in Canada, some in northern United States, district heating is now being used with data centers in order to reclaim the waste heat. For years, people had said that the waste heat was, was not salvageable because it wasn't high enough of a delta T. Um, particularly now that um, IT equipment has gone from an ASHRAE use of 72 degrees up into the high 80s, um, there's much better uh, delta T and higher heat that's being delivered from these systems. And so you can reclaim that heat and use that. The advantage to the community is they get um, free energy as it relates to coming back from the data center. The utility doesn't have to supply that type of energy. And the data center usually gets um, a discount on their power up to and including their power for free. So it requires an investment in some of the equipment up front, but a data center that gets its power for free and that's their main consumable, that's well, well within their interest and it's driving this type of technology. A lot of the technology that's being used for data centers, and for years there's been discussion as related to um, smart buildings, smart cities. That's also then changed into Internet of Things and digital transformation. But that's been around for 10 years, 15 years, and a lot of people have talked about it, but they haven't been able to deliver it. Uh, this particular building here just opened up in March. Um, it's an intelligent building where everything is all interconnected. The, the fire systems are connected to the security systems, connected to the cooling systems, the building elevators, escalators, um, the occupant experience um, based off of mobile credentialing where you can walk into a room and it'll set temperature, set your passwords, set everything based off of your own credentials um, as an example. Um, it's a lead setup building where they're using 50% less energy than a standard building and 28% of it's being delivered by photovoltaic. Uh, the nice thing about this is, as I mentioned, everything's all interconnected except for even the fire is being monitored, but fire has to be on an autonomous loop based on code. So within the energy efficiency piece of this, high energy efficient um, equipment's being used. The lighting, for example, is all LED lighting, but there's occupant sensors. There's temperature controls within the lighting. Um, there's also Wi-Fi tied into the, light, the lighting. So all this works as a, a campus environment to be able to bring it on back um, to an energy efficient model. One of the unique things that's being done is uh, what we're calling uh, cognitive effects. So basically working with Harvard, a study was done to where based on t turns of air within the system, temperature, humidity, um, you, it's actually been proven you can get a 10% increase in human output um, based off of the right environment. So by being able to set that environment and allow people to be able to set that parameter what works for their body as well, 
uh, increases the actual cognitive effects within that building. And as I mentioned, everything's all tied together in a platform. So the security systems are talking to the elevator systems, talking to the building management controls, fire systems, cooling systems. And it's more than just um, mobile credentialing, knowing that I've got 20 people waiting for the elevator. Um, normally when you push an elevator and you hear, get more than one call signal, you know you have um, the need to send a second elevator. But in this particular case, you know you need 20 people for that elevator. But with predictive diagnostics, you can trend that. You can do things so that at 8 o'clock in the morning, you know the majority of the people are going to come in on ground floor, and you have to take them to 5th floor and 11th floor. At 5 o'clock at night, you need to stage the elevator so that 5th floor and 11th floor can take people down. Um, in an emergency situation, such as active shooter, for example, you now know the number of occupants that are within the building and general location of where they are in that building. Um, gets into a little bit of discussion as far as Big Brother watching, but it's also for our safety reasoning in order to make sure that the building's cleared uh, in the event, in case an event occurs. As I mentioned, Internet of Things, all these devices, whether it's cooling, security, fire, chillers, air handlers, all that information can be sent back um, on an Internet of Things platform. And there's data analytics systems that'll look at all this information. Taking a look at that information, you can now look at it on a systematic basis across your whole enterprise. In this particular case, you see a mixture of green and then red. Parameters were set off of energy efficiency based off of how each of those locations were being used. And you can see where red occurs, you can now drill down into that. You can see what piece of equipment, what device is not meeting its parameters. So you can look all the way down to the maintenance level of that equipment. You can make informed decisions based off of that information looking at that equipment. And you can do predictive and preventative maintenance and diagnostics on that equipment to maintain an energy efficient portfolio. All that information can then be fed back into a data-driven financial and ROI model. Knowing how your equipment is performing, knowing what equipment is more efficient than other equipment helps you make those business decisions in order to, to drive an energy efficient operation. And again, that can be whether it's a data center, an office building, a retail complex, as that information is being drifted um, throughout your, your organization, all that can be brought in and you can take a look at it and make informed decisions. With that, I'd like to offer it up for any questions and thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, the question was, what advances have been made in air-cooled chillers for the, the higher temperature environments? Um, I have to get the acronym correct, the IPLV, is that correct? Um, has been um, tweaked as far as the efficiencies with the variable speed screws uh, to where it can deliver um, uh, efficiently 135, 140 uh, degree perfor um, ambient performance. Any other questions? Again, thank you very much for your time.